1987, Kansas City, Missouri. An 89-year-old grandmother is assaulted and strangled to death in her own home. The murder itself was very violent, very brutal. There was a lot of blood on the carpet. The case goes cold within months, and for 16 years, the killer remains at large. I didn't want it to ever become a cold case that just never got solved. Will new technology unleash the secrets of this old evidence? The whole evening, I was pacing, wondering who it could be, who it could be. She was really looking for that needle in the haystack. Can investigators finally put the fiend behind bars? He became very, very violent. The fact that he would have been out there as a predator is scary. It's scary for all of us. Kansas City a place that Edna Walton has called home since the 1940s. She was a strong woman, very independent. She liked the fact that she had a house and that she had uh, purchased it herself. In 1987, at the age of 89, Edna Walton still lives proudly in the snug bungalow that her grandson Lawson so fondly remembers from his boyhood. One thing that stands out in my mind about my grandmother was right when you first came in the door, she'd give you big hugs, and it was uh, to the point that it would hurt. She always wore bright red lipstick, so when you ended up with the lipstick all over your cheek. With all of her family living out of town, Edna's mainstay is her friend, David Nogar. She always would give me advice and tell me, don't you stay out? too late, don't you drink too much, don't you run around with the wrong people. Small things like that made me feel a great affection for her. As the years pass, Edna's family relies increasingly on David to keep an eye on the senior. When Edna became older and older, her daughter Betty would, you know, do you mind looking in? And I, I never did. He actually called her on a daily basis just to see how she was doing, make sure everything was OK. But it's not unusual for Edna to miss a call. She was getting a little bit deaf. And you could hear the TV on the street when you would go to her house. When Edna didn't answer the phone, I would run over. A good safety check. Because outside Edna's front door, the community is changing. It was the beginning of the drug era. And there were unsavory people in the neighborhood. It was just an area in decline. For my parents, it was a bit of a concern. But armed with her billy club, Edna refuses to be afraid, even after a late night break-in. Two men came into the house, and she woke up, and they were standing at the end of her bed. And she started screaming and howling at them, and she chased them out of the house. She was feisty. She was feisty. The senior said nothing about the incident to her family. Edna did not want to be moved out of her home. She loved it there, and she just was not going to leave, no matter what. She felt capable of, of dealing with anything that was in front of her, so. On August 26, 1987, David Nogar makes his daily call to Edna. The phone rang and rang and rang. He heads over to check on her. But as he approaches Edna's home, the hair on the back of his neck stands on end. When I didn't hear the television in Edna's house, I knew something was wrong. And I walked up the steps slowly. The door was open a few inches. Once inside, Nogar makes a horrific discovery. There was a lot of blood on the carpet, and Edna was on the floor. It looked as if she'd been beat. Sexually assaulted and strangled to death. 
I went over and felt her, and she was cold. The fan had caught some of the blood. It was just very eerie. I then called the police. For investigators, the crime scene tells a chilling story. There were droplets of blood in the dining room and then um, going into the living room. It appears that Miss Edna kept backing away from her attacker, but she wasn't able to escape. And it was very near her front door where she, she eventually died. The details of that death are heartbreaking. Miss Edna had multiple injuries, but she died of um, manual strangulation. So she had a broken jaw and a broken neck. She was, um, I'm quite sure, um, fighting until the very end. Edna's family is devastated. I don't know how to describe the feeling. It was very overwhelming. Your grandmother's dead. You start questioning who might have done it, why they did it, what was their motive. Detectives find no evidence of a robbery. She had a social security check in her purse. Her house had not been ransacked. And even the watch and ring on her finger was still in place. And there are no signs of forced entry to the home. Miss Edna's assailant came in through the front door and probably was allowed in. She always kept her front door locked and was always look out to make sure she knew who was there. So you start thinking about who had access to the house, who would she have let in. The police take a hard look at David Nogar. It is certainly not uncommon for the person that, that alerts the police to be linked to the crime in some way. They made me sit down on the sofa and they wouldn't cover up the body or and so i had to sit there until the coroner came a strategic effort to put more pressure on nogar it became clear to him that he was a suspect it is close to midnight by the time police finally take him to the station for an interview detectives would come in and question me for 10 or 15 minutes and then leave for maybe five or ten minutes and then a different detective would come in and question me. And this went on all night. David Nogar is fingerprinted and forced to provide a hair sample before being released, at least for now. He was just too close to the family and made no sense. Back at the crime scene, detectives continue their search for evidence. Tape lifting is just basically using a two-inch wide tape to gently pat down surfaces at a crime scene. It's used routinely to collect loose trace evidence, such as hairs, fiber. Police also gather evidence from Edna's body, including loose hair strands. While most appear to be hers, 14 hairs were actually identified as foreign to Edna Walton. Hairs likely shed by the killer during the assault on the senior. In 1987, the technology that was available really for hair analysis was primarily microscopic comparison. So looking at an unknown hair from a crime scene and comparing it to the suspect. Will the hairs be a match to David Nogar? The suspect is going to be in your case within the first 24 hours. Or might Edna's brutal killer remain in the shadows forever? I didn't want it to ever become a cold case that just never got solved. Edna Walton, an 89-year-old grandmother, has been assaulted and murdered in her own home. Her close friend, David Nogar, a suspect in her brutal slaying. To me, it was unbelievable. They took samples of hair, but will it match the strands left by the killer on Edna Walton's body? We're magnifying anywhere from 100 to 400 times the features in the hair. Before the day is done, the lab has an answer. We were able to determine that David Nogar was excluded as a potential donor of that hair in Edna Walton's case. I felt a sense of relief. David just was too close to my grandmother to have had anything to do with it. 
In fact, the foreign strands gathered at the crime scene bear no resemblance to those of David Nogar. The hair itself had characteristics that were typical of African Americans. They realized that the person that had done it was a black male. The news heats up a simmering investigation. The police went door to door trying to ask um, neighbors, did they see anything? But Edna's home was surrounded by bushes and trees, and the senior had little interaction with the community outside her door. But she did know the woman next door because they would see each other in the yard and borrow things from each other. The neighbor's name is Wanda Tillman, but she and her husband, Marshall Tillman, had moved away weeks before the murder. However, Mr. Tillman still came and went a bit from that home. He was coming back to the house daily to get his mail. In fact, Tillman tells police he was at his old house the day of the murder, but he saw nothing unusual next door. Nor, it seems, did others in Edna's neighborhood. The police interview anyone and everyone connected to Edna. It was becoming apparent that the police weren't, weren't finding anything. Edna Walton's family wanted to know who murdered her. So it was very frustrating. You just continually think about it. What possibly you've missed or forgotten? Is there something the police could check out? I didn't want it to ever become a cold case that just never got solved. Months go by, and then years. But Edna's family and friends refuse to forget. I would call the police department and ask if they had any new leads, are they still working on it, and just, just try to let them know that there were people still out there that cared. Every time I would see a murder of similar circumstances, I would immediately call the police to the point where they told me not to call anymore. In 2002, 15 years after Edna's murder, Lawson sees something on a cop show that gives him hope, DNA profiling. You know, you're just grasping at straws, and DNA sounded like the next, uh, the next straw to grasp at. He contacts police yet again. I received a phone call when I was working the night shift. We got a lot of phone calls from people who were interested in having us look at their family's older cases that didn't have the benefit of the DNA. But this call will be pivotal in reviving the investigation. Sergeant Eckert is very tenacious. No one had picked up that case for, for several years. So the next day, Sergeant Eckert digs up the old paperwork from homicide storage. I had Lawson send me a picture of her because I had no image of who I was dealing with. Edna's case strikes a chord. It did become personal. I think it's because of Edna's age. She was a grandmother. She loved her family. She loved her grandkids. She was a very independent woman. Sergeant Eckerd carefully reviews the original investigation. In all my homicide training, we're told that the suspect is going to be in your case within the first 24 hours. It's entirely possible that the original detectives had unknowingly been face to face with Edna's killer. Without the ability to test the DNA, everyone in that case file was still a person of interest because they hadn't been able to rule anyone out. Can Eckert build on the work of the original detectives and accomplish what they could not? There were several people in and out of Edna's life. She had some fresh cut trees in her yard, so they knew that she had someone come and do yard work for her. When officers canvassing the neighborhood happened upon the gardener... He ran from them. When someone runs from you, there's a reason they're running. They apprehended the man and took him in for questioning. He denied any involvement in the offense. He had a warrant, which is why he ran. And once he cooperated with them, he was never considered a suspect any further. Then, investigators learn that only weeks before her death, Edna had, for the second time, found an intruder in her home. The encounter quickly turned violent, but Edna's wits saved her. She told him, oh, it's my heart, my heart, and he then ran out of the house. I wondered if the man had come back and had murdered Edna. Edna had told this family friend 
that she knew this man by a first name. William was probably no more than a boy. She felt he was probably about 15, 16 years old, and they had indicated might have lived a block or two away. Investigators had combed the neighborhood. But they never had any luck finding out who this William was. Within months, the case went cold because they had followed up every lead and with no DNA available at that point, there was nothing else they could do. Can DNA now give new life to the cold case? To find out, investigators must first track down the hair strands left on Edna's body by her attacker a decade and a half earlier. Evidence that was collected in 1987 is stored and preserved in our evidence property warehouse. Or so they hope. My first concern was whether or not we still had the property. And without that property, this case was going no further than it already had. And Edna's vicious killer would remain at large. The fact that he would have been out there as a predator is scary. It's scary for all of us. In 2002, 15 years after the savage assault and strangulation of Edna Walton, Sergeant Barbara Eckert hopes to create a DNA profile of the killer. But she knows that might well be impossible. This case occurred in 1987, and any number of things could have happened to that evidence. And that was the big question. Did they still have the evidence, and could they get DNA? Sergeant Eckert contacts forensics expert Linda Netzel. Basically to inquire as to whether or not there were any samples that we might be able to run DNA analysis on. There has been incidents in the past when we've gone to look for property and then it's not been found. It's either been released or destroyed for whatever reason. You're dealing with literally 500,000 pieces of evidence in that warehouse at any given time. To investigators' relief, everything still remained in property. I found the hairs that were collected from the victim's body at the crime scene. Should we get DNA profile, it was, it was pretty profound that this would be who our suspect was. So then the, the question became, how quickly can we test it? And you know, what's, what's next? As investigators are about to find out, the future of this cold case depends on the past. In 1987, hairs were essentially mounted in a semi-permanent medium. And removing them would be no easy task. First, Netzel soaks the slide. To help break down that glue that has hardened over that time frame and loosen the slide cover so that you can remove the hairs. Then she scrapes the glue from the hair strands because that material will definitely interfere with obtaining a DNA result. And as if that's not challenging enough, these hairs may not provide sufficient root tissue for a DNA profile. Most hairs that we find at a crime scenes are naturally fallen. So there's very little root tissue that's on those samples. And that's primarily what we were dealing with in Edna Walton's homicide. Little wonder investigators aren't holding their breath. Then the DNA results come in. The good news is we did get a full genetic profile of an unknown male. A profile that surely belongs to Edna Walton's killer. Linda Netzel submits the profile to the National DNA Database of Known Offenders. But to her profound disappointment, we did not obtain a hit. The person I was looking for had not yet been arrested and his DNA had not been taken. You start having some hope. Then when they found out that there were no DNA matches, it just was another step back down. But Barbara Eckert refuses to give up. I truly believe that the person who had killed Edna had killed someone else, and we just hadn't associated the two cases. So Eckert returns to the file room and makes it her mission to pour through cold cases. I was looking for other homicide cases to match Edna, which would be an elderly female who had been killed inside their residence with no signs of forced entry. 
There was so much shoe leather type detective work that was involved pulling these old case files literally from dusty warehouse space and getting these files out and going through them. And you have to go through them page by page and look at every case and try to see which cases match your criteria. There were literally thousands of cold cases. Every day I would pull a case and look it over and I was doing this as well as working current homicides. So this was what I did in my free time. And though months of research turn up nothing. We talked a lot during that period of time. And that was kind of my role to keep kind of pushing things along. Knowing that, that I had the responsibility to them, that's what kept me going. Finally, in July 2003, six months into her search, Sergeant Eckert finds a case with grisly parallels to the Edna Walton murder. I thought they were very similar, eerily similar. When I contacted Linda and told Linda the similarities, I think she was as excited as I was. I, I was just blown away. It was an elderly woman. She had been murdered in her home. And that case had not been solved either. This time, the victim was 82-year-old Connie Tyndall. She, too, had been sexually assaulted before being killed. The murder itself was very violent, very brutal. Connie died from strangulation as well as blunt force trauma, where she was beat severely. And not only did she live less than 10 miles from Edna. In Connie's case, there was no sign of forced entry, so she had also let someone in. Might Connie Tyndall's visitor have also had a hand in Edna Walton's murder? I saw the brutality of it, and I felt that this was not a one-time incident. For over six months, Sergeant Barbara Eckert has been combing through cold case files in search of Edna Walton's killer. I truly believed this person had committed other crimes, just as heinous and that we just hadn't caught him. Now, she's come across the 1989 case of Connie Tyndall. It's chillingly similar. It was an elderly woman who was strangled and beat inside her home. The prime suspect in that investigation, one Michael Gorman. At the time, the detectives felt strongly enough that they were able to get him charged. He was arrested based on the fact that his fingerprint was on the victim's phone. But that was something Gorman had been able to explain away. He had dated her granddaughter. Once the prosecutor reviewed the case, they felt that they didn't have enough to hold him because the fact that he did have a reason to be in her house. To the dismay of investigators at the time, Gorman walked away from the charges. But if he had, in fact, murdered Connie Tyndall... I thought he could be responsible for killing Edna. Eckert runs his name through the computer and to her shock. I saw that he had been questioned in another homicide case. And that was a homicide that involved Christina Williams. Michael Gorman was connected to Christina Williams because he was the person last known to have seen her alive. Unlike Edna Walton and Connie Tyndall, both in their 80s, Christina Williams was just 24 when she was assaulted and murdered. She was found dead in a park and she'd been shot. Once I reviewed the case and I saw the brutality of it, I felt that this was not a one-time incident. Eckert is convinced that Gorman is responsible for the murders of both Tyndall and Williams. To prove it, the team must once again look to the past. In the 1980s, it was routine if the detectives had a suspect for them to collect hair standards. But without the benefit of DNA testing, police at the time couldn't be sure that the hairs found on the bodies of Connie Tyndall and Christina Williams belonged to Michael Gorman. Will modern day science now reveal once and for all Gorman's innocence or guilt? We were all excited and she's running the DNA and, and of course it takes a couple months. In the meantime, Sergeant Eckert assigned Detective Ray Lenore to follow up on Michael Gorman. We were given the task of locating him and getting him in for an interview. They find him at his home. We asked him if he would accompany us to the homicide unit, and he did. Ray's a really good interviewer. He's a bulldog. He will come at you quietly, but he'll keep coming. 
Lenore begins by asking Gorman about his relationship with Connie Tyndall. Tell me, because you said you did a few jobs there for Miss Tyndall. Michael Gorman had sort of a relationship with Connie Tyndall to the extent that he had done odd jobs around the house. So it was conceivable that his prints and other DNA belonging to him would be in that house. But if the strands of hair found on Tyndall's body do turn out to be Gorman's. Could you have hugged her just because she was an old lady that you liked and that you cared something about? No. Nothing like that. I respected that. I understand really, that. But no, no physical contact. He said that there was no way that his, his DNA would be on her. What was the closest that you ever got to? I mean, when you were there in the house working. At least or were you actually in the same passing by her, sitting on a you know chair or something, just passing by? Lenore's partner then questions Gorman about victim Christina Williams. Do you know Christina Williams? No, I don't. Do you know anyone by the name of Tina from back then? No, I don't. Did you ever use narcotics with this woman? Never. Don't even know her. Incoming lab results in both cases say otherwise. Michael Gorman's DNA was found to be on Connie Tyndall as well as on Christina Williams. Evidence enough to charge Gorman with both their murders. But what about Edna Walton? Will the hair found on her body also prove a match to Michael Gorman? I thought I had it. I mean, it was I was kind of a little euphoria there, thinking, OK, I've got him now. But her optimism is short-lived. We contact Sergeant Eckert, of course, and let her know that Michael Gorman he does not match the evidence from the Edna Walton homicide. I hadn't found the killer of Edna. The silver lining. I was able to determine who killed Connie and also who killed Christine. Sergeant Eckert's work led to an absolute answer in two homicides. It was very satisfying. With Gorman safely behind bars, Eckert focuses once again on Edna Walton's murder. Just in time for that investigation to take a shocking new turn. Those detectives in 87 had him the whole time and never realized it. In investigating Edna Walton's homicide, Sergeant Barbara Eckert has inadvertently caught another killer. I was very disappointed that I hadn't found who killed Edna, but at the same time, I was very glad to clear two more homicide cases. Relentless, Sergeant Eckert returns to the Dusty Files once again, determined that this time she will find Edna's killer. She was really looking for that needle in the haystack. I went through 44 cases and did not find anything. I don't think give up is a part of Sergeant Eckert's uh, profile. Every couple months, I would call Lawson and let him know what was going on. Our biggest ally was the police department. Barbara was on top of it, taking it seriously and still pursuing it. It's disappointing to call the family and tell them you haven't found the person who killed their loved one yet. Nearly a year goes by, and though Eckert seems no closer to identifying Edna Walton's assailant, the CODIS database keeps up the quest for a match to the DNA left behind by the killer. Every time new samples are put in from convicted offenders, the computer continues to search. But are investigators waiting in vain? You start to wonder, is this person that committed the offense dead? This case might never be resolved. Then, on October 14, 2004, 16 years after Edna's murder, we get a phone call from the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. And it is their DNA supervisor who's notifying us that there has been a match. Linda called me at home to tell me that we had had a DNA hit. And I was just, I was speechless. The match is to an inmate serving time in the state of Kansas, but... We did not know yet who that offender was. They had to confirm it first. And that confirmation process involves pulling the convicted offender's DNA sample and rerunning it to verify that it is, in fact, the same person. So 
So you'd think waiting 24 to 48 hours is not that big of a deal, but it really was that we were very anxious to get the name. I couldn't wait till I got the confirmation. I was shaking like I'd had too much coffee. The whole evening I was pacing, wondering who it could be, who it could be, and what has he done since. The following day, investigators get their answers. He was in custody in Kansas on a, a rape charge of a juvenile. Even though the girl died from an asthma attack shortly after the assault, her assailant was convicted only of sexual assault and sentenced to 12 years. His DNA finally entered into CODIS when the database was expanded to include sexual offenders. Now, to investigators' alarm, we were told that the offender was due to be released fairly soon. Putting the could-be killer back on the streets where he's at risk of disappearing for good. His name, Marshall Tillman. I told her, I, I know that name. That name is somewhere in one of these cases. I could hear the keyboard. She was pounding away on the keyboard, looking him up. As Eckert quickly discovers, Marshall Tillman lived next door to Edna and was interviewed in the days following the senior's death. Once I found out it was the next door neighbor, I was flabbergasted. I mean, no one suspected him. Two years after taking on the case, Eckert makes the long-awaited phone call. I remember it was just a rainy day where I was driving down the road and I answered the phone just like you do any other day and she said that they'd found the DNA match. When I told him that the DNA hit had been to Marshall Tillman, um, he was just speechless. I don't know how to describe the feeling. I was crying at one point in time. They just kind of brought everything back fresh. He just couldn't believe that someone that he had trusted and associated with was responsible for his grandmother's death. He came over to the house to pay his respects. I was shocked to think that anyone would be so brazen, so cold-hearted to come over and give their condolences for someone he had murdered. The biggest question um, left in the minds of this family was why? This is an 89-year-old woman at the time Marshall Tillman was 35. Why would he do the things that he did? In their effort to find out, detectives tracked down Marshall Tillman's ex-wife. Wanda Tillman was terrified, absolutely terrified of her ex-husband. Can investigators convince her to talk? In 2004, 16 years after the slaying of Edna Walton, a DNA profile has pointed detectives to her suspected killer, Marshall Tillman. Once I found out it was the next door neighbor, I was flabbergasted. I mean, no one suspected him. Before confronting Tillman, who's due for release from prison in less than a month, investigators want to learn all they can about him, including what might have been his motive for murdering Edna. They begin by seeking out his ex-wife, Wanda Tillman. She had been divorced from Marshall for a long time, and we got the impression that she had been hiding. She was very upset that we had found her. She kept asking us, how did you find me? How did you find me? Because she believed that if we had found her, then he could find her. When we told her that we had a DNA hit and that Marshall is the person who had killed Edna, she broke down. She became shaking, crying, extremely upset. And she said to us, I always thought he was responsible. So why hadn't she come forward? I believe Wanda was terrified of him. He had abused her throughout their whole marriage. But the situation worsened when Marshall got involved with illegal drugs. He started using PCP, and he became very, very violent. That violence continued to escalate. Wanda finally left her husband. But in the days prior to Edna's murder, she came back to check in on the elderly neighbor. She actually had a vase that she had borrowed from Edna and was going to return it. That's when Edna told Wanda that Marshall was squatting at their old house, even though the utilities had been shut down. He didn't have any water in the house next door, and Marshall was hooking and stealing water from Edna's spigot outside. And Edna told Wanda that she was going to confront him. And Wanda told Edna, don't, don't say anything to him. But the feisty senior was not one to back down. 
that she paid for it with her life. Mr. Tillman did threaten her, but Edna did not elaborate on what the threat was. Edna did say that if it happens again, she would call the police. Wanda truly believes that Marshall, with his um, outrageous anger control problem, lost it, and that's when he killed Edna. Sergeant Eckert prepares to confront Edna's killer. It made me very angry to think that she probably trusted this neighbor and that he, you know, did this to her. It was, it was upsetting. She was ready to, to get her crew together. I contacted my detective, Ray Lenore. And the two traveled from Missouri to a correctional facility in Kansas. When you have victims like Edna Walton, they are very vulnerable victims. So you feel compelled to do the extra, to do more, I think. Eckert is keen to come face to face with the man she has been hunting. In the normal course of events, I would never be in the interrogation room. But I had to be in the room with this one. I needed to be there. So I went in with the camera. The prisoner and his guards are not far behind. So when Tillman comes in the room, um, he's a big guy. Lenore opens the interview with routine questions. His name, his age, some of his experiences. You are sorry? Yes. You are honorably discharged. How much time do you spend in the room? As for the time he had left in custody, that was almost up. He was talking about making preparations for what he would do when he got out of jail. You gonna buy a car and you get out of here? Saving up some money? I'm trying. <laughs> he was quite um, cocky, I would say. And seems to have no idea why investigators are there. The reason he consented to talk to me to the degree that he did is because he wanted to see what it was I had to say. What is the purpose of being Well, we'll get into it. At the back of his mind, he had to know that he killed this woman years and years ago. This case that you were initially contacted on, it's a 1987 case. 1987. Mm -hmm. Almost right away, you get a sense that he's a certain amount of shrewdness. He thought he had his hand on it, and he had gotten away with it. Then Lenore cuts to the chase. And, uh, that's all I'm talking about. He got real quiet, and he got kind of still. I could see his demeanor change. I mean, he's, his, his whole countenance just kind of dropped. You are not willing to talk to us about that no more. And he said, I'm done talking. And that was it. He shut down. He actually pushed back away from the table and didn't want to talk to me anymore, refused to talk to me anymore. We alerted the people there in the jail that we were done. But this is just the beginning of a long road to trial. As police prepare to lay charges against Tillman, he prepares to dispute their evidence. His claim was that we had somehow mistaken his DNA with the DNA that we found on Edna Walton. Can a simple swab settle the DNA debate once and for all? And he thrashed about, moving his head around. He had to be taken to the floor. 16 years after the vicious murder of Edna Walton, police believe they have finally found her killer, Marshall Tillman, the man who'd lived in the house next door to the 89-year-old. It made me very angry to think that she probably trusted this neighbor and that he did this to her. DNA from hair strands left on Edna's body by the man who assaulted and murdered her is a perfect match to Marshall Tillman, but that doesn't stop him from insisting he's innocent. His claim was that we had somehow mistaken his DNA with the DNA that we found on, on Edna Walton. The courts demand that Tillman provide a new DNA sample. The investigators know they need to get it from him fast. Marshall was due to be released in just a few weeks. This man, likely a brutal killer, could be back on the street. I obtained a, a search warrant from a Jackson County Circuit Judge 
to get a buckle swab, a DNA sample from Marshall Tillman. A buckle swab is a cotton swab, and they rub it around their cheek and, and gum area. But will Tillman comply? I presented him with the search warrant, and <laughs> he told me then that he had no intentions of consenting to give the swab. So at that point, we restrained him. He continued to resist to the, to the extent that he had to be taken to the floor. And he thrashed about, moving his head around. And we finally held his head steady. And I inserted the swabs into his mouth. But even investigators are shocked at what happens next. Marshall bit down on these wooden sticks and snapped them in half. He spat it out on the floor. Contaminating them so they were no good for us to use. Can Tillman hold out long enough to ensure he's released from prison before investigators can lay murder charges? Well, at that point, we had to go before a judge and get a court order. Although he is forced to submit a sample. He wanted a, a private agency to do it. He didn't trust the police. An independent person did the swabbing of his cheeks and put it in a container and then handed it to Ray. The results are not surprising. Once those swabs were tested, it was confirmed that Marshall was the killer of Edna Walton. Despite that evidence, he refuses to own up to his crime. Marshall Tillman pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. In February of 2008, Marshall Tillman is tried in a Jackson County courtroom. Edna's grandson, Lawson, doesn't miss a day. I always felt his presence, you know, behind me. You've been dealing with this for years, and now you finally have the person who they think did it in court, and you're sitting there looking at this person 10, 15 feet in front of you. It was really, really difficult for him, very difficult. Especially given the arguments Tillman's legal team puts forward. The defense's case still kind of angers me that Miss Edna um, very possibly fell down, causing her own injuries, uh, breaking her own neck, and that she killed herself. <laughs> A preposterous tale in light of the evidence. DNA from Marshall Tillman's hair found on Edna Walton's battered body. It was very clear that this was a very brutal assault on her. There was blood on her fireplace. There was blood on a fan. There was blood on the walls. There was quite a bit of, of physical evidence there of her assault. Very good police work preserved that crime scene so that even 20 years later, we can kind of piece together what happened. A simple neighborly dispute turned tragic, though even investigators admit that's only their best guess. Two people know what happened that day. Miss Edna and the defendant, Marshall Tillman. Marshall wasn't gonna tell us what happened. And so thankfully the DNA did. And after just five hours of deliberation, the jury convicts Marshall Tillman of first-degree murder. I never witnessed a moment of remorse in Marshall Tillman. He is sentenced to life in prison. It was a great relief. It was no longer this just infinite thing that you potentially were going to deal with for the rest of your life. It was finally done. I knew Edna could rest better knowing that her murderer was finally coming to justice. Miss Edna is one that you don't forget. You can't just walk away from it. You know, you remember cases like this. I look at photographs from my grandmother's house, and you evolve to a point where you look at those photos again, and you don't see the fringe of a crime scene. You see the family environment where you grew up, and those memories of the bad things that happened kind of fade away. If it hadn't been for DNA, Marshall Tillman would still be out there walking the streets. Sergeant Eckert was driven to find the guy that assaulted Edna. And thanks to her relentless work, Michael Gorman is also serving time for the murders of Connie Tyndall and Christina Williams. That was just icing on the cake. It was a great feeling to know that these other families were getting some resolution. Every step of the way, no one gave up. And in the end, we won. For more information, go to ownca.oprah.com slash murder she solved.